If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Luke chapter 18. That's where we're going to be camped out this morning. We're going to actually start with one little section, but we're going we're to cover the whole chapter of 18 in some way, shape, or form this morning. So as you get there, you, you've noticed that, uh, that there's, there's no resume required is the title of this message. And so I want to bring you back. If, if, you, if you wouldn't mind for a minute, go back to that first resume that you filled out. You created it. You you carefully cultivated the words that you would use, right? Because when you're when you're looking at your first job, or or really it's any job, there's a pretty high level of trepidation when you're walking in. You're like, I I want this job. I don't know if I'm going to get it. And the point of a resume is to communicate who you are to someone who has no idea who you are. It's a pretty intense document. <laughs> If you really think about it, you got a piece of paper to tell somebody who you are. And what we, te what we tend to do is we try to find really attractive words that we never would use in our regular language to describe our skill set. And so, you know, I thought it'd be fun to, to go look at some of those ridiculous resumes on LinkedIn. And so here are some titles, some job titles that people have placed on their job resume in real life. This is not made up. One accountant said that they were an accounting ninja. <laughs> Can you imagine typing that out and saying, yes, this is the correct way to describe myself? Another one said, I'm an opportunity cultivator. I'm not really sure what that means. The next one is a social media rock star. You're hired, done. That's all we needed to hear, right? This is maybe my favorite one. I, someone out in, that, in our world said that they are the commissioner for happiness and purpose fulfillment. You tell me what that means. I, I, what job would that be necessary? I don't know, right? Like, and, but but it, it, it's funny, though, because sometimes people love to hire candidates that have this, like, you know, come from behind, I've overcome a lot. We like to have that story on our team or our staff, be like, hey, this is, we, we're, we're overcomers. Well, there's, there's one guy that under achievements, he, he thought, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play to this idea that, that I'm an overcomer. And he wrote that he maintained a strong GPA throughout his entire college career, despite logging over 3,000 hours of video game play. <laughs> That's real. Someone put that on their resume. Here's what's funny about those, is we know they're ridiculous. We know that these people are, are posturing themselves for something that they don't even know what they're posturing for. But what ends up happening is this is the way our world functions. A resume is to prop ourselves up, to exalt our skills so that we will get hired, that we'll win. And this mentality of achievement and accomplishment is, is really ingrained in us from, from when we were very little, right? It's those grades in elementary school that are gonna, the trajectory of the rest of your life is on first grade, right? But that's what we're like, you gotta do good on this test, you gotta do this, you gotta do this. That's a good resume builder is something you start to hear when you get to high school and college. Like it's ingrained in us that we need to achieve and accomplish. And I think we would probably be a little foolish to think that that mentality has not snuck into our faith. That we need to accomplish. That we need to be achievers. That we need to have the best resume in our faith. And so what we're gonna do today is we're gonna look at a, a parable that Jesus teaches. And we're gonna look and he gives us one person that's got a fantastic resume. And then he gives us another person that has no resume at all. And he teaches us something about the fact that we, in the gospel at the foot of the cross, there is no resume required. So in Luke 18, verse 9, read along with me. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evil, evildoers, adulterers, or even this tax collector. He said, I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all that I get. 
but the tax collector stood at a distance. He would never even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and all those who humble themselves will be exalted. What an amazing parable. What a great story. And I, here's what I love about this story, is Jesus is walking to Jerusalem. He's on his way to the cross here in a few short days. And he's meeting people all the time. If you've read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you know this. He's, he's interacting with people all the time. And all of a sudden, he comes up with a made-up scenario as if this scenario doesn't play out literally in every single interaction he has with people. But he gives us a picture. Two men doing the same thing, going to the temple to pray. But they pray two very different prayers. One guy has a great resume, and one guy has no resume. The, to, to the audience that would have been hearing this story, the hero and the villain would have been obvious. The Pharisee is the hero. And the tax collector is a traitor. Making money off their own people for a foreign government. And so we know going into the story, the hero and the villain, but watch what Jesus does as he turns it on its head. And so here's what I want to do this morning. Like I said, we're going to look at all of chapter 18. We're going to kind of bounce from this story to the rich young ruler and then back to this story. And then we're going to go to the blind man with a couple of verses down and then back to the, this story. So just as, as, you're, as you're listening and, and watching, um, just know that's where we're going. Let's read once again, verse nine. To some who are confident, that word confident can also be uh, translated as persuaded. I love that word. To some who were persuaded of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like, one of the, uh, like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even this tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all I get. My first point this morning is that the proud trust their own resume. Right? Like that's what he's doing. Like when I was sharing this uh, with, with one of my sons, what I was going to talk on, I read in the passage, and I was like, what, what's your takeaway? He's like, sounds like he's praying to himself. Like, Bingo. <laughs> yeah. My favorite comedian would, des would describe this guy as a me monster. He's just all about me. Look what I've done. I, I tithe and I fast twice a week when only one's required. And I'm not like these other people. He's all about me. And we see, we, we can do this sometimes. Around, and I, I don't know if, if uh, we would ever actually say these things out loud. We probably are socially aware enough to know we don't say these out loud. But maybe we think them. Maybe we think, oh man, I'm, I'm so glad I'm not that person. Like, for instance, my, my wife and I have an ongoing conversation via text that I will send her articles or I'll send her a meme or a, a reel on Instagram, uh, and it'll be some story of some husband or some guy that's just kind of an idiot. And I send her, I send her the picture or the story or whatever, and I just put, you're welcome. <laughs> because at least I'm not that guy, right? Like, come on. Give me some credit here. Like, <laughs> a lot of people give us a lot of material to actually get to this mindset, don't they, though? Man, at least I'm not that guy. I'm, 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 not, I'm not that bad. But this Pharisee, he is the epitome of the I'm a good person theology. He comes to this, the, the, the temple, and he's going to pray. and says, hey, man, look at me. Look how, aren't you, God, aren't you lucky to have me on your team? And I was thinking about what, what would a modern day mentality look like for us today? And I think it would be this. A modern day spiritual resume would start with two words. At least I'm not them. At least I haven't done that. At least I haven't gone there. At least so you see, I, I don't think that most of us have the heart of like, hey, look at me. If I'm being honest with myself, it's, it's a lot more of the, well, at least. 
least I'm not that. At least I'm not them. At least I do this. But it's still, the sneaky confidence there is still in me. It's I'm good. It's my resume. You see, the Pharisee spent his time praising himself, thanked God that he was generous, fulfilled his religious obligations, and was not like the tax collector. The mistake the Pharisee makes that Jesus points out is that he used other people as his standard for righteousness, at least. Because if you're anything like me, growing up, I was, the standard for what was really good was just below where I was. It was always like, well, you know, I'm, I'm pretty good. I, I don't do this, and I don't do that, and I do this, and I do that, and I go to church this many times a week, and blah, blah, blah. It was... It wasn't pride, like outwardly prideful, but it was very much, well, but it's, look at me. At least I don't do those things. And so we flash forward just a few verses to see the practical example of this in the life of the rich young ruler in Luke 18, verse 18. And you have this young man that comes to Jesus with a great question. He says, how do I get eternal life? And Jesus says, well, you know the law. And he rattles some off and the rich young ruler says, oh, good news. I've done all of those things since I was young. I've done all of them. And then Jesus says, yes, but you lack one thing. He says, go take all of your money and give it away to the poor and then come follow me. What is Jesus saying here? What I think Jesus is saying is, he's like, yes, but your confidence is still in you. It's in your behavior and it's in your money. That's where your confidence is. That's what you trust. So get rid of that false idol and then follow me. And the rich young ruler, it says, walks away sad because he had great wealth. And I love the turn of phrase there. Here's, here's what I would say is he walked away sad because his great wealth had him. That's the truth. His confidence was what, what he had, what he could do. And he could not give that up to follow Jesus. So he left sad and alone. His mistake, as well as the Pharisee, is that they believed the power was in themselves. And so then Jesus turns in verse 13 back to the tax collector. He says this, but the tax collector stood at a distance he would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. What a difference of a prayer. You got the me monster, the at least theology, the I'm a good person theology, and then you've got this guy who's got nothing. He just says, God, I need your mercy because I know who I am. So my second point this morning is that the humble trust God's mercy. You know, when I was playing t-ball as a kid or little league baseball, there was this thing called the mercy rule. And if you've played sports as a kid, you probably know this. And it was, it was a wonderful and terrible thing depending on which side you were on. I always wanted to be on the side of giving mercy, right? because that means you are whooping up on somebody. And there's, there, but the, the, the funny thing is, is that the, the team that's receiving mercy, that they're getting beat so badly they end the game, there's this weird tension of relief and shame. And I think that's our problem with mercy. We want it, but we really don't. We want to give the resume. We want to earn it. We want to be good enough. But the amazing thing is, is God doesn't play with the mercy rule. He actually reigns with mercy. His kingdom, he reigns with mercy. He's not like, ah, ha, 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 you gotta have mercy. No, no, he is willing. He, the, God's word says he is rich in mercy. 
You see, this prayer is a prayer of confession. It's a prayer of self-awareness. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Isn't this the real sinner's prayer? It's not Jesus come into my life. It's God, I need your mercy. For I know who I am, I know where I've been, I know what I've done, I know what I've thought, I know what I've looked at. I got nothing other than to fall on your throne of mercy. You see, the tax collector uses God as his standard for measuring righteousness, not other people. And when we do that, we have no other option than to say the exact same thing. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And then we see this play out right after this in Luke 18.35 with the blind man. So we have a parable, and then we have a real practical, real-life scenario that happens. So Jesus is walking to Jerusalem, and there's a commotion, and there's this blind man who's saying, who, who, what's happening? What's going on? And they say, Jesus of Nazareth is walking through. And this blind man, out of desperation, starts screaming. What does he scream? Son of David, have mercy on me. And then Jesus stops. Like Jesus is headed to the cross. He knows what's coming. But what stops Jesus in his tracks is someone self-aware enough to say, I need mercy. That's all I, that's all I can ask for. And Jesus says, bring him to me. And there's this amazing interaction where Jesus says, what do, what, what do you want me to do for you? Like, we, we can kind of read that like, Jesus, he's blind, bro. Like, he's like, what do you want me to do for you? What is this mercy that you desire? And he says, I want to see. And he says, then go, have your sight. And the man leaves the presence of Jesus exuberantly joyful, praising God. And then everybody else around does the exact same thing. What a difference. The, 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 the rich young ruler leaves alone and sad because his confidence was in himself. But the blind man who cries out for mercy leaves the presence of Jesus, worshiping him and glorifying him and bringing other people to celebrate with him. The humble trust God's mercy. And so he continues in verse 14. He's wrapping up his parable. Jesus says this, I tell you that this man, the tax collector, rather than the other, went home justified. And that's a real churchy word, isn't it? I like to look up what the actual definition is in, in the Greek language. And the definition of that word justified means this, made right or as he ought to be. He's, he's made right as he ought to be. For, and Jesus says, for all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and all those who humble themselves will be exalted. And so my last point this morning is that humility always wins. Humility always wins. Jesus exalts the humble tax collector, not the resume builder. Put it another way, God's mercy is greater than our merit. His mercy is greater. Because that's what we need. I don't know about you. Are you worn out? I remember I hit some points in my life as a young man. I was just exhausted trying to be a really good Christian. Because I was just, I, all the weight was on me. And then all of a sudden I saw my sin that I was choosing to do. And I was forced into a crisis of, I'm either going to walk away from my faith because it is unattainable, or I have to. I have to yield myself to the mercy of God. And isn't it wonderful that we serve a God whose kingdom is reigned with mercy? The very thing that we need, he provides and willingly and eagerly gives. Titus 3 Verse five says, he saved us, not because of our righteous things that we have done, but because of his mercy. That's how we're saved. John Wesley echoes this thought when he says this, there is no merit but in the blood of Christ, that salvation is not by the merit of works, 
and that there is nothing we are or have or do which can deserve the least thing at God's hand. There is no deserving. There is no resume building. Our resume is the righteousness of Christ that has been given to us. We are bankrupt. And not only has he given us access to his account, he has deposited his account into ours. That's mercy. And so when it comes to this idea of humility always wins and this parable that God's mercy is greater than our merit, there's only two outcomes. And when you start to look all throughout the gospels, when Jesus interacts with people over and over and over, here's the deal. This story of the, the tax collector and the Pharisee is told over and over and over and over. The titles and the people change, but the heart is the same. All of us are either the Pharisee or we are the tax collector. Our posture towards the Lord is either I'm going to build my resume, I'm going to do good, I'm going to be a good person, or I'm going to fall at the foot of the cross and say, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Those who are self-righteous, who trust in themselves, find themselves on the outs over and over and over. Think about it. When you start thinking about the interactions Jesus has with people, those who are self-righteous are always on the outs of God's kingdom. If you're familiar with the prodigal son story, like this is a perfect example. You got the prodigal, he is the tax collector, right? He's the partier. He goes and he takes all the, all the inheritance and he, and he wastes away. But then you got the older brother who stays at home, does all the right things, works really hard for his dad, and he never does anything foolish. At the end of that parable, who is inside the party with the father and who is on the outside? It is the humble, repentant brother who came back and said, I need mercy. So those who are self-righteous find themselves on the outs, and those who are self-aware and humble find themselves on the inside of God's kingdom. Like when we start thinking about the, the stories that we're familiar with, maybe from when we're young, you look just one chapter over in, in Luke 19, you see Zacchaeus, the tax collector. He leaves the presence of Jesus transformed. And then you see the apostle Peter, after he denies Christ and meets Jesus on the beach, he leaves Jesus restored. You see the thief on the cross, and he is with Jesus in paradise. You see the woman who washes Jesus' feet with her tears, forgiven. You see the tax collector in this story justified. You see the blind man healed, and you see the prodigal son welcomed back. Humility always wins. So whether you have a good resume, a bad resume, or no resume, it doesn't matter because Jesus is your resume. The gospel says it is not your righteousness, it is his that has been given to us. And so then it comes to us, how do we respond to that kind of love? How do we respond to that kind of mercy? Do we go and just do whatever we want because all we know we'll get mercy? No, 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 no. That's abusing the mercy of God. We say, who are you? And I want to follow you and yield my life to you. You see, humility always wins. Ephesians 2.13 says, but now in Christ, you who were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. You remember in the parable, who is standing far away at the temple? The tax collector. And it's through the blood of Christ, not his good works that bring him near to God. And it's who Jesus has come to seek and save. So what do we do with this as we walk out of here today? Well, that last verse says, he who exalts himself will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. So the so what is how do we humble ourselves? How do we do that? Remember that tension? I don't want to do that. But I know I need to do that. Because that's my only option. So what do we do? I want to offer two things this morning. Number one, begin a regular rhythm of confession, just like the tax collector. On a regular basis, go before God, not with your resume, not with your church attendance, not with your tithe, but with just God. 
I need mercy today. What if every day that you woke up, before you grabbed your phone and checked your email or your social, before you grabbed the phone, hit the floor and say, God, have mercy on me today. I know who I am. I know what I'm capable of. Have mercy on me today. And then at the end of the day, hit the floor and say, God, thank you for your mercy today. It's just confession. It's just admitting and agreeing with God, this is who I am, and this is who you are, and what I need is what you have, and he is rich in mercy, and he will give it to you. If you don't know where to begin, start with a simple prayer of God, would you show me myself? Holy Spirit, would you show me who I am, that I might rightly respond to you? So begin with a regular rhythm of confession. Secondly, yield to the authority of Christ in your life. That's how we respond to this kind of mercy. This is how we respond with, to this kind of grace and this kind of love. It's not with fighting and, 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 and for control. It's yielding control. Saying, God, if you love me like that, then I can yield and trust you with this. And so we begin with a regular rhythm of confession. And then we yield to the authority of Christ in your life. And what I mean by that is yield to what God shows you through his word and through his spirit and through his people. What does God's word say? How is the Holy Spirit leading you and convicting you? Yield to that and follow him. You know, when I first got my first job or I was filling out my first resume, I remember my dad told me a line that I never thought I'd use in a sermon. But I, I'm going to say the first part, and I want you to say the second part with me, because I know you know it. It's not about what you know. It's about who you know. Do you know Jesus? Do you know Jesus? Or is it, no, nah, it's, it's about my resume. It's about what I know. Because it's not. It's about who you know. There is no resume required at the foot of the cross. Simply a heart whose trust is placed in the mercy and love of God through Jesus Christ. I'll finish with 2 Corinthians 5, 21, where Paul writes, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled, be made right with God. God made him, Jesus, who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him, we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus is the resume. Let's pray. Lord, want to thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you for the mercy that you have shown us. Thank you for the mercy that you are willing to give joyfully God, would you help us to be self-aware enough to know who we are before a holy and good God? God, help us to be bold enough to yield our lives to your authority, that we may live a life that is honoring and glorifying to you, and that those around us would also, too, be welcomed into your kingdom because of your mercy. In your son's name, amen. Crossings, have a great day.